Hi, you're listening to the History of Ancient Greece podcast. Ryan has been so kind as to allow me to tell you a bit about myself before delving into his latest topic. My name is Liv, and I host a podcast called Let's Talk About Myths, Baby! Every two weeks, I tell you a story from ancient Greek mythology, but there's a twist. See, I tell you in a way that reflects where we are now in the world. I have no qualms with pointing out how ridiculous some of their stories were. I mean, do you know how many times Zeus tricked a woman into sleeping with him by transforming himself into various sorts of animals? Seriously, it's weird and pretty twisted. I also highlight the treatment of women back then. They're so often the villains of the stories, and it wasn't because ancient women were inherently villainous. I tell the myths in a casual style, highlighting the insanity and the troublesome aspects while still reveling in the wonder and general awesomeness that is ancient Greek mythology. You can find my podcast wherever you listen to this one, or you can visit my website, MissBaby.com. You can also catch me in your typical social media realms like Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I'm at MythsBaby on every one of those platforms. Thanks, dear history lovers. On to the show! Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 72, The Wrathful Queen. Hera, as the queen of the heavens and the wife of Zeus, is considered the greatest of the goddesses and is the guardian of women, marriage, childbirth, and the family unit. Her origins are generally thought to lie in a powerful pre-Hellenic goddess, or goddesses, whose cult was adopted by the Mycenaean Greeks. Her name has been connected by some scholars with the word hora, or season, indicating her fertility and ripeness for marriage, while others, both ancient and modern, connect her name with air, which means air, hence the divine wedding that denotes the union between heaven and the enlivening wind. They argue that her name then is an anagram, meaning the letters of air, at one point, were rearranged. Her name is also attested on Linear B tablets from Pylos and Thebes as Aera, though it's found in connection with Dewo or Zeus. The same etymology makes Hera a feminine form of Heros or Hero, and this background may help to elucidate the goddess's complex ties to the Bronze Age heroes, particularly Heracles, and the genesis of the Greek concept of the mythic and cultic hero. Hera was the daughter of Kronos and Rhea, and so she was the sister of Zeus, Poseidon, Hades, Demeter, and Hestia. She was either born at Argos or Samos. Both cities made competing claims, as we shall see. She was one of the children that Kronos had swallowed, and the first to come to light when he regurgitated them. She did not participate in the Titanomachy, though, as she was raised and guarded by Oceanus and Tethys. After Zeus banished the Titans and divided the dominion over the world with his brothers, he was in the market for a wife. The chronology is funny. The chronology is fuzzy, so we aren't exactly sure how long Zeus was the king of the Olympians before he decided that he needed to marry, but Zeus had taken a liking to his sister Hera. She resisted him at first but Zeus preyed on her empathy for animals and other beings. He caused torrential rain, created a thunderstorm, took the form of a kaku, which is a medium-sized, long-tailed bird, and pretended to be in distress. Shaking, he sat on the goddess's lap. She took pity on the bird and covered it under her robe. Then, Zeus took his real form and attempted to unite with her sexually. Hera resisted because she was afraid of what her parents might think of her losing her virginity, but succumbed when Zeus promised to take her as his lawful wife if she would sleep with him. And ever since their union, the Kaku has been the cult symbol of the goddess. Afterwards, the wedding of Zeus and Hera took place in the Garden of the Hesperides, at the ends of the earth. 
a fertile garden where all things grow lush and effortlessly. Gaia gave to Hera golden apples as a wedding present, which she in turn planted in this garden. This resulted in the famous tree of the golden apples, where Heracles would one day gather fruit as part of his labors. The tree in the garden symbolized one of Hera's main functions, shared later with her daughter Elethea, as the overseer of childbirth. All of nature burst into bloom for their wedding, and many gifts were exchanged. Zeus had invited all of creation to his wedding, and all attended, except for one, a nymph named Kelone. When he asked her why, her excuse was that she preferred her own home, so Zeus transformed her into a tortoise so that she could carry her house with her wherever she went. The story can be found in one of Aesop's fables, and from it derives the proverbial sentiment that there's no place like home. Anyways, with her marriage to Zeus, Hera officially took the title of the Queen of Olympus. In art, Hera is commonly seen with the animals that she considers sacred. In addition to the aforementioned kaku, in the Hellenistic period, Hera became associated with another type of bird, the peacock, which were not at all known to the Greeks before the Persian conquests of Alexander. Aristotle even referred to them as the Persian bird. She also had an association with cows, corresponding with Zeus's association with the bull, and her best-known Homeric epithet is bupis, or cow-eyed. In this respect, Hera bears some resemblance to the Egyptian deity Hathor, a maternal goddess associated with cattle. In art, she is portrayed as majestic and solemn, often enthroned, and crowned with the polos, a high cylindrical crown worn by several of the great goddesses. Her Roman counterpart is Juno. Hera is a member of a ruling dynasty, and within the political institutions on Mount Olympus, she exercises considerable authority. In the Iliad, her appearance in the Assembly of the Gods produces instant and respectful attention, and her policy decisions are readily accepted by the other divinities. Like the other gods and goddesses, the Queen of the Olympians receives her own praise in the Homeric hymn to Hera. Quote, of golden-throned Hera I sing, born of Rhea, queen of the gods, unexcelled in beauty, sister and glorious wife of loud-thundering Zeus. All the gods on lofty Olympus reverence her and honor her together with Zeus, who delights in thunder. End quote. It is important to note from this hymn, as complimentary as it seems at first glance, that Hera derives her status and worthiness from her relationship to a male. The gods honor her together with Zeus, who is her brother and her husband, and so the power accorded to a woman has to be viewed within a framework of overall male control. Hera's authority is shown to derive ultimately from that of her husband, and in the words of Aphrodite in the Iliad, honor must be accorded to a goddess who lies in the arms of Zeus, since he is the greatest. The secondary status never quite sits well with Hera, and much of what drives her activity is her resistance to the subjugated role. There has been considerable scholarship about the possibility that Hera, whose early importance in Greek religion is firmly established, was originally the goddess of a matriarchal people, presumably inhabiting Greece before the Hellenes. In this view, her activity as a goddess of marriage established the patriarchal bond of her own subordination and her early resistance to the conquests of Zeus that is rendered as Hera's jealousy is the main theme of literary anecdotes that undercuts her ancient cult. However, it remains a controversial claim that primitive matriarchy existed in Greece or even elsewhere. Still though, Hera figures prominently in myth as a wife and a queen, and one who can convince Zeus to do her bidding with other, more indirect means. Homer in the Iliad describes a particular sexual union between Hera and Zeus, in which he provides a portrait of a more subtle and manipulative Hera who uses sex as a source of her abundant power. In order to distract her husband from a turn of events in the Trojan War that he surely would not approve of, she threw herself enthusiastically into a magnificent scheme of seduction. She bathed and adorned herself with the utmost care, and engineered a chance meeting with Zeus on Mount Ida. With the aid of a magic girdle, borrowed from Aphrodite, she succeeded in reawakening Zeus's gusto. Quote, there under them, the divine earth grew newly sprouted grass, dewy clover, 
crocuses and hyacinths, so thick and soft, it held the hard ground deep away from them. There they lay down together and drew about them a golden wonderful cloud, and from it the glimmering dew descended. End quote. This description may preserve a memory of an earlier concept of Hera as an earth goddess, whose sacred marriage to the sky deity causes vegetation to spring forth. But in Homer's poem, Hera is much more than a personification of the earth. She is a strong and vigorous personality, and it is to marriage on the human rather than on the cosmic level that she principally relates. However, the model of marital relations presented in Homer's poem definitely does not present a positive image of a woman's role in this sort of dichotomy. For example, when Zeus discovered that his encounter with his wife was part of an elaborate plot, he threatened her with a whipping and reminded her of the violent punishments which he has inflicted on her in the past. And so, for all of Hera's forcefulness, the pattern of male domination is clearly reaffirmed in these glimpses into the domestic life of the Olympians. On the other hand, even though Hera was the ultimate wife and queen, she was seen as a negligible mother. All of the myths concerning Zeus's individual affairs with other divinities, which we mentioned in episode 59, show him coupling with goddesses who preside over universal patterns and producing children who exhibit further concern for order. But with his wife Hera, Zeus created three children who introduced unpredictability and chaos into the universe, those being Hebe, Ares, and Eletheia. Hebe was the goddess of youth who during banquets served as the cupbearer of the gods on Mount Olympus, pouring them nectar and ambrosia. She also helped Hera enter into her chariot, and she drew baths for her brother Ares when he returned from the battlefield. In art, Hebe is usually depicted wearing a sleeveless dress and represents youthfulness or the prime of one's life. She was often portrayed by the poets as having the ability to give eternal youth, and in art she is typically seen alongside her father in the guise of an eagle, often offering up a cup to him. This depiction is seen in classical engraved gems as well as in later art and seems to relate to a belief that the eagle, like the phoenix, had the ability to renew itself to a youthful state. But when Zeus became interested in a young Trojan boy named Ganymedes, he decided to make him his new cupbearer, replacing Hebe. This represents the fact that youth eventually fades away and can be replaced by someone else newer. Zeus and Hera's second child is Ares. He is the god of war, although his tactics are much more chaotic than the strategic Athena. He is wild and savage and enjoys the noisy confusion of the battlefield. He appears when the battle line breaks down and men are fighting amidst chaos and slaughter. He had a very rocky relationship with his father Zeus who was much more interested in the order of Athena and not the chaos of Ares. Finally, their daughter Eletheia watches over childbirth and midwifery, which originally was Hera's responsibility until she passed it to her daughter. Eletheia needed to be present for the birthing process to be completed. As we will see in a future episode, the Greeks did not look upon childbirth well because it is a violent, chaotic time that only happens with much pain, screaming, blood, and of course the constant threat of death. Hera's other child was Hephaestus. Depending on what source you read, he was either born unilaterally by Hera or with Zeus, as we mentioned in episode 67. Regardless, he was born lame, and according to Homer, she was so ashamed of him that she hurled him from atop Mount Olympus. The two would later be reconciled, but in Homer, we clearly get the image that Hera was far from the ideal mother. Other sources provide a slightly different picture of Hera's maternal instincts, though. Apart from her own children, Hera raised Thetis as one of her own daughters, saw that she married well with Peleus, and always protected her and her son Achilles. Another of her favorites was Jason, whom she aided in his quest for the Golden Fleece. She also raised the Nemean Lion, the Lernian Hydra, and the monster which guarded the apples in the Garden of the Hesperides, all beasts that would later be slain by Heracles, as we discussed in episode 47. Hera protected those who honored her, but she was terribly cruel and vengeful against those who wronged her. Quite a few tales of Hera's wrath are told by the Roman poet Ovid in his poem The Metamorphoses. 
One in particular involved a forest nymph named Echo, who resided on Mount Kitharone in Boeotia, and who had the job of distracting Hera while Zeus was having his affairs, by leading her away and flattering her with lengthy conversations. When Hera at last discovered the deception and her role in it, she cursed the once talkative Echo to only be able to repeat the words of others, hence our modern word Echo. When Echo met Narcissus, a hunter from Thespia and Boeotia, and the son of the river god Cephasus, and another forest nymph, Lerope, she immediately fell in love with him on account of his beauty, but she was unable to tell him how she felt and was forced to watch him as he fell in love with himself. This occurred because he was a proud man who only cared about himself. Nemesis, the god of retribution, noticed this behavior and attracted Narcissus to a pool, where he saw his own reflection in the water and he fell in love with it, not realizing that it was merely an image of himself. Unable to leave behind the beauty of his own reflection, Narcissus lost his will to leave that spot, and ultimately his will to live. When Narcissus died, wasting away before his own reflection, Echo was consumed by a love that could not be, as she mourned over his body. Echo too lost her will to live, and eventually she began to waste away. Her beauty faded, her skin shriveled, and her bones turned to stone. Today, all that remains of Echo is the sound of her voice, and Narcissus is the origin of the term narcissism, a fixation with oneself and one's physical appearance or public perception. Hera was the most grandiose goddess of the Olympians, and the rest of the gods respected her, as did her husband, despite his unending adulteries. Even Zeus, who as the king of the gods was known to fear nothing, feared her tantrums, because when the goddess became angry, all of Mount Olympus shook, and the globe stirred the same way as when Zeus got angry. Still though, Hera was jealous and watched closely as every step, but ultimately yielded before her almighty husband, as Zeus never wavered in the authority over his wife, no matter how many vows he broke, although she never forgave his love affairs. Zeus, though, continued to have many relationships with females after he formally married Hera, and so most of the myths about her stem from her jealousy over these affairs. Because it is to Hera that matrons turn for success in bed, for stature in their home, and for the wisdom to run it well, and so she particularly despises his infidelities because they threaten the stability of the family that she wants to protect, as does Zeus, but that does not prevent him from also wanting to spread his seed far and wide, and so he often snuck down to earth in disguise to bear children with the mortals. Although at times it's clear that he genuinely loved Hera, Zeus also wanted many mortal children to inherit his greatness and become great heroes and rulers of Greece. Hera was always aware of Zeus's trickery, and kept very close watch over him and his excursions to Earth. Although Hera is angry at Zeus for his infidelity, she typically punished the easier targets. And so with particular stubbornness, she continuously tormented the paramours of her husband, along with any conspirators, and Zeus was powerless to stop his wife. For example, she manically pursued Leda, the mother of Apollo and Artemis, Io, the daughter of Inachus, the founder of the Argives, Semele, the mother of Dionysus, and the nymph Callisto in Arcadia, whom she transformed into a bear that was then killed by Artemis, just to name a few. Hera's wrath wasn't just intended for the female lovers of Zeus either. There were some unfortunate male mortals who experienced her ire too. For example, she particularly hated Peleus, a king of Iolcus, because he had killed Sidero, his step-grandmother, in one of the goddess's temples. In revenge, she later convinced Medea to kill him after she had arrived with Jason when he had returned home from retrieving the Golden Fleece along with the Argonauts. But above all, the many illegitimate, at least in her eyes, offspring of Zeus felt her wrath. For example, Dionysus was torn to shreds at Hera's command, only to later be put back together, and she dispatched the monstrous Pytho to dispose of Apollo, though this too was unsuccessful. The one who underwent the greatest sufferings at the hands of Hera, though, was Heracles, who paid throughout his life for the love that his father had showed to him. In fact, the name of Heracles means the glory of Hera, and was an ironic name given to him by some of the gods purely to anger the queen of the Olympians. 
It had been a rule that no mortal son of Zeus would receive divine honors unless they had nursed with Hera's milk, which was a way that she was able to keep her revered status despite her husband's failings. However, she was tricked into suckling Heracles as a baby, the one exception, which is why he was able to become immortal later, after much suffering as a human that is. To learn more about the life of Heracles and the torment he endured by his stepmother, check out episode 47. Some myths, though, state that in the end, Heracles reconciled with Hera by saving her from Porphyrion, a giant who tried to rape her during the Gigantomachy, and that in appreciation, she even gave her daughter Hebe as his bride. Heracles' deification, though, was a classical period invention which creates an awkwardness with the earlier Homeric account in which Odysseus encounters Heracles in the underworld. Whatever myth-making may have served to account for an archaic representation of Heracles as Hera's man, it was thought suitable for the builders of the Temple of Hera at Paestum to depict the exploits of Heracles in relief. Still though, in myth, Hera is far from being a tender, caring mother figure, and acts out the role of the archetypal wicked stepmother. Hera's wrath was also aimed at those who made what she saw as the wrong choices. For example, Tiresias was originally a priest of Zeus, and as a young man, he encountered two snakes mating, and so he hit them with a stick. As a result, he was then transformed into a woman. As a woman, Tiresias became a priestess of Hera, married and had children, including his daughter Manto, from where we get the word mantis, meaning seer or prophet. After seven years as a woman, Tiresias again came across two mating snakes. Depending on the myth, either she made sure to leave the snakes alone this time, or according to Hyginus, she trampled on them and became a man once more. As a result of Tiresias' experience as both a man and a woman, Zeus and Hera asked him, as he was currently in the man form, to settle the question of which sex, male or female, experienced more pleasure during intercourse. Zeus claimed that it had to have been women, or at least the women that he was sleeping with, and Hera claimed that it was men. When Tiresias sided with Zeus, Hera struck him blind. Since Zeus could not undo what she had done, he gave him the gift of prophecy. An alternative, and less commonly told story, has it that Tiresias was blinded by Athena after he stumbled onto her, bathing naked. His mother, Chericlo, begged her to undo her curse, but Athena could not, and so she gave him the power of prophecy instead. Regardless, from then onwards, Tiresias served in Thebes as a blind prophet of Apollo, the goddess of prophecy. He participated fully in seven generations, beginning as an advisor to Cadmus up until the story of the Epigoni, or the Wars of the Sons who originally fought in the famous Seven against Thebes. We will cover Tiresias in more detail when we get to Apollo and prophecy. Perhaps more famously, Hera also became enraged the Trojans because of the so-called judgment of Paris, when in a beauty contest, the Trojan prince Paris decided to pronounce that Aphrodite was more beautiful than Hera and Athena, the other two competitors. For this reason in particular, Hera and Athena helped the Greeks in their fight against the Trojans. And when the Trojan prince Aeneas was trying to escape to Italy, she did everything in her power to sink his ship and disrupt his journey. She complains of her spurned beauty during the contest, the responsibilities taken from her daughter Hebe that were given over to the Trojan boy Ganymedes, who becomes the cupbearer on Mount Olympus as we mentioned, and the general disrespect that her plans receive from her husband Zeus. The negative qualities with which Hera is invested in myth are important because they tell us a great deal about the attitudes of the Greek males to marriage and motherhood. But the mythological portrait should not overshadow the quite different picture that emerges from a study of her role in cultic practices, where she was venerated as the protector of an institution that was not only central to a woman's experience, but was recognized as a vital component of Greek social structures. To the people who took part in her rites, and more especially to her female worshippers, she must have presented a far more positive image than can be seen in myth. In some of her cults, Hera is similarly viewed primarily as a bride or wife, and her status as Zeus's consort is central for worshippers. But in her most famous cults, those at Argos and Samos, she is a powerful city goddess who fosters economic and military success. 
In these cases, her relationship to Zeus is not a crucial factor, and the literary portrait of a jealous, scheming wife seems far removed from the cultic experience of an awe-inspiring deity who brings success in battle, multiplies the herds of cattle, frees the enslaved, and protects the young for her chosen people. Compared to this mighty goddess, who also possessed the earliest temples that we know of, those in the early 8th and 7th centuries BC, at Samos, Argos, and Olympia, and two of the greatest 6th and 5th century BC temples at Poseidonia, or Paestum, the harsh-tempered and overbearing woman of Homer, and the other mythographers, is an almost comical figure, portrayed as the archetypal nagging wife who keeps a jealous watch over all of her husband's movements and shows considerable resentment when he fails to consult her. And now, let us take a short break for a word from one of our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by Masterclass. Imagine learning cooking from Gordon Ramsay, photography from Annie Lebowitz, or basketball from Steph Curry. Well, now you can with Masterclass. Masterclass produces online classes taught by the best in the world. Each class is shot with cinematic production quality and offers on-demand lessons loaded with exclusive content you'll find only on Masterclass. Choose from classes taught by over 30 masters, including cooking techniques from Chef Thomas Keller, screenwriting from Aaron Sorkin, filmmaking from Martin Scorsese, and much more. Whether you're pursuing your passion, developing your career, or just looking to learn something new, Masterclass gives you access to the best of their craft so that you can master yours. Interested in more than one class? Check out the All Access Pass. With the new All Access Pass, you can unlock every class from over 30 masters, all for the price of two. The History of Ancient Greece listeners can get the All Access Pass at masterclass.com slash H-O-A-G. Learn more from the best in the world at masterclass.com slash H-O-A-G. That's masterclass.com slash H-O-A-G. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. Major cult centers of Hera were not evenly spread throughout the Greek world, but instead were characteristic of certain regions and peoples. The Dorians of the Peloponnese, and those Peloponnesians who colonized southern Italy honored her the most, though she did enjoy some privilege in certain Ionian cities in the eastern Aegean. The center of her cult, though, was in the Argolid, mainly in Argos with the renowned Heraion, founded on the northern slope of Mount Euboea, at a short distance from Argos. Other temples dedicated to Hera stood in Tyrants, Corinth, Paracora, Epidaurus, Hermione, Sicyon, in the Arcadian cities of Mantinea, Megalopolis, and Stymphalus, in Olympia, and in Sparta, as well as on the islands of Paros, Delos, Kos, Astyapalaya, and Crete. Of particular significance was the sanctuary of the goddess on the Ionian island of Samos. Her cult enjoyed its greatest prosperity during the Archaic period, when Argos and Samos were at the height of their political power. Despite Homer's pan-Hellenizing tendencies, he does recognize Hera's regional character as a goddess of the Argive Peninsula, giving her the epithet Hera Argea in the Iliad, in which she says, quote, The three cities I love the best are Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae, end quote. In historical times, she became the city goddess of Argos itself, and her Argive sanctuary, which stood between the former Mycenaean powers of Argos and Mycenae, was the most venerable and famed center of her worship. Her festival there, known as the Herea or Hecatombea, or the sacrifice of 100 oxen, was held in the first month of the year. A grand procession escorted the priestess, who rode in an ox-drawn wagon from the city to her sanctuary several miles away. The male youth, who was recognized as being the most virtuous, carried a sacred shield in the procession, which marked the transition for him and those of the same age as him into adulthood, and thus into warrior status. After the procession, there were athletic competitions for which the prize was a bronze shield, similar to the aforementioned sacred shield. Herodotus provides a well-known anecdote involving a priestess of Hera Ergea. Although he doesn't mention her by name, Plutarch later calls her Sidipe. She was on her way to the Herea when the oxen which pulled her cart broke down from exhaustion, so her sons, Cleobus and Bitone, pulled the cart the entire way. 
a distance of 45 stadia, or about 8 kilometers. Sidippy was so impressed with her son's devotion to their mother and the goddess, so she asked Hera to give them the best gift that a god could give a person. As a result, Hera had the two brothers drop dead instantaneously, because the best thing she could give them was for them to die at the moment of their highest devotion and acclamation. This famous story of Herodotus comes couched as advice from Solon, as evidence while trying to convince the Lydian king Croesus, who the most blessed people in history are, that it is impossible to judge a person's happiness until they have died a fruitful death after a joyous life. The most often used quotation from this story is, roughly translated, call no man blessed until he is dead. Hera's cult at Argos shows a preoccupation with two aspects of the Argolid's prosperity, the herds of cattle on which its wealth was based, and its military might. Terracotta figurines from the Horaeon indicate that Hera was also viewed as a chorotrophic deity, or one who nourished and protected the young. Often she is shown holding a child in her lap. Sometimes she holds not a child but a horse, an emblem of aristocratic privilege. Hera's cult seems to have been closely bound up with the efforts of the early archaic Argives to define their relationship with their heroic past. In fact, the Argive Horaeon was constructed of the remains of a Mycenaean settlement, but there is no clear evidence of continuity of cultic worship from the Bronze Age to the 9th century BC, when activity at the Horaeon becomes archaeologically visible. Around 700 BC, though, a terrace was built using huge Cyclopean blocks in imitation of the Bronze Age architectural style, and shortly thereafter, a temple of stone and wood with a colonnade was added. This archaic structure was not superseded by a newer temple until after it had burned down in 423-422 BC. Excavations have found a cache of inscribed bronze tablets, recording among other things, the sums borrowed from the state treasury of Hera to pay for the construction of this temple. It possessed sculptures depicting not necessarily myths of Hera herself, but subjects of interest to the Argives, such as the birth of Zeus, the Gigantomachy, the Trojan War, and the Saga of Orestes. One of the most famous pieces is the so-called Head of Hera, though its identification has been doubted recently. It's also unsure whether it comes from a cult statue of the goddess or a sculpture that decorated the western pediment of her temple in Argos. It was a product of the Peloponnesian workshop, which has been associated with both the school of Polycletus and Polycletus the Younger, and the head of Hera is now housed in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens. In Pausanias' time, one could enter the Temple of Hera at Argos after walking through a series of statues of the former priestesses, called Kleidukoi, or keyholders, whose tenures provided a chronological framework for the city's history. The list of priestesses was already ancient in the 5th century BC, when Hellenicus used it as the basis for an account of the Greeks from the Trojan War to his own day. The cult image of the classical period was a famous one by Polycletus, fashioned of gold and ivory over a wooden core. The seated goddess held a scepter and a pomegranate, symbols of power and fertility. A more ancient wooden image must have existed, but presumably was destroyed when the archaic temple burned. When Pausanias visited the temple, he saw a venerable image of pear wood taken from nearby Tyrants, another ancient Horian cult center which the Argives had installed on a pillar beside Polycletus' statue. The pillar itself may have held special significance, because a fragment of the Argive epic Pharonis describes Hera's priestess adorning the high column of the Olympian queen Hera Argea with fillets and tassels. Another item of interest in the temple was the couch of Hera, a symbol of Hera's status as the bride of Zeus. The head of Hera adorned the coins of Argos, and it has been argued that the image on them imitates the head of the goddess's cult statue, in which Hera wears the polos, a high crown usually decorated with floral designs, and the diadem, earrings, and a necklace. The river Asterion, near the Horaeon, was regarded as the father of Hera's three nurses, the nymphs Acrea, Prosimna, and Eubea, who were named after features of the sanctuary's topography. Local tradition therefore held that Argos was Hera's birthplace. 
Women conducted secret rituals at the Horaeon, involving purifications, sacrifices, and the offering of garlands twined from a local herb, also called Asterion. The women wove a robe for Hera, as they did at Olympia, first taking a ritual bath in the waters of the spring, or well, called Amaimoni. The hundreds or so of miniature water vessels, called Hydriae, from the excavations further attest to the importance of water in these activities. Perhaps the ritual involved a bath for Hera's sacred image, because a legend describing how Hera took an annual bath to restore her virginity was attached to the spring Canathos in nearby Naplia. For most women, virginity was an essential prerequisite for marriage, and Hera's yearly rebirth as a potential bride may well have been seen as an event which recreated and reaffirmed her role in the marital relationship. The so-called water of freedom of the stream Eleutherion near the Horaeon was used for the women's secret rites that were not to be spoken of, called Eraton, and was also drunk by slaves and prisoners about to be emancipated. Hera's daughter Hebe, whose statue stood beside hers in the Horaeon, similarly granted asylum to suppliants and freed prisoners at her ancient sanctuary in Phileos. Hera may have been the first deity to whom the Greeks dedicated an enclosed roof temple sanctuary at Samos around 800 BC. It was replaced later by the Horaeon, one of the largest of all Greek temples. Half of one column from the Horaeon at Samos has been reconstructed, scarcely hinting at the former glory of this sanctuary. A succession of temples stood in the marshy site, beginning with the late 8th century BC Hecatombadon, or a hundred foot temple. The temple created by the Rochus sculptors and architects was destroyed between 570 and 560 BC. This was replaced by the temple commissioned by the tyrant Polycrates around 540 to 530 BC. One of the later temples was a truly gigantic ionic structure with a forest of 155 columns, which Herodotus called the largest temple of his time. There is also no evidence of tiles on this temple, suggesting either that a temple was never finished or that the temple was open to the sky. Samian excavations have revealed votive offerings, many of them from the late 8th and early 7th centuries BC. Among the dedications at the Samian Horion were over 30 house models in stone and terracotta. The Hera sanctuaries at Argos and Paracora have also produced similar models with a geometric decoration, causing speculation that the houses were intended to represent the earliest temples, before the construction of Hecatompeda. Given the fact that Hera's temples are found everywhere amongst the earliest of those attested, this is probably likely, but other explanations are possible. If the models represent chieftains' houses, they could then symbolize Hera's association with political authority and social status. The center of Hera's sanctuary at Samos, and its earliest feature, was the altar, which existed from the 10th century BC onwards. Like the temple, it was rebuilt several times, culminating in a monumental 40-meter structure. All this grandeur, however, came after the sanctuary was well established. Although it was not of Panhellenic stature, like the Sanctuary of Hera at Olympia, the fortunes of her sanctuary at Samos rose considerably with those of the maritime state of Samos in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Asius, a poet of this period, described the wealthy Samians visiting the sanctuary dressed in flowing white tunics with long hair bound in golden bands and adorned with gold jewelry. A stunning variety of imported objects was uncovered in the excavations, which show that Hera at Samos was not merely a local Greek goddess of the Aegean, but she had enjoyed a reputation throughout the eastern Mediterranean and enjoyed a large influx of pilgrims. In fact, there are Egyptian ivories, Babylonian bronze figurines, and a collection of exotic animal trophies including crocodile and antelope skulls, as well as other votive offerings of objects made from Armenia, Persia, and Assyria. In spite of the cosmopolitan nature of the sanctuary though, the dedications show that it was also a local center of worship. The excavations turned up many humble, crudely carved vessels and figurines, as well as natural curiosities like coral and rock crystal. There were conflicting stories about the origins of the sanctuary and to what degree it was dependent on the rain at Argos. 
One tradition said that it was founded by the Argonauts, who brought the cult statue from Argos, while the Samians themselves said that Hera was born here under the Yulgis, a willow-like tree preserved in the sanctuary, and that the place was founded by non-Greek Carians. Still, their tradition allowed that the first Greek priestess of the sanctuary was the Argive Admete, a daughter of Eurystheus. Once, Carian pirates had attempted to steal the cult image of Hera, but found their ship immobilized when they placed the statue on board. Terrified, they left the image on the beach with a food offering and made their escape. There, the searching Samians found it, and believing they had ran away, bound it to the Olgus with the tree's flexible branches. Admeti herself purified the image and restored it to its place in the temple. This myth provided the background for the annual festival called the Tanea, or the Binding, during which the goddess's cult statue was carried to the sea, purified, and given a sweet meal of barley cakes. At some point during the rite, it was probably also bound with Yolgus branches. Celebrants at the feast wore wreaths made of Yolgus and reclined on beds of it. The people in Samos out in the open air consumed sweet wine, like in weddings, praising Hera for being the bride and the mistress of their island. There, then followed a wedding bath and the wedding banquet. This festival has been interpreted as a drama of the deity's disappearance and return, in which the recovery of the goddess is symbolic of the yearly cycle of vegetative abundance. A related possibility is that the drama expresses the Samian's anxiety should Hera, the protector of their city and guarantor of their good fortune, abandon them. The goddess is annually bound to her birthplace, and her proper residence at Samos is reaffirmed. The myth itself asserts that even should outside forces attempt to move the goddess, she would express a preference for her home and actively resist leaving it. There are indeed indications that Hera at Samos was a goddess concerned with fertility. Among the objects dedicated to her were pine cones and pomegranates, real fruits as well as clay and ivory models, symbols of fertile reproduction. The offering of pomegranates, however, appears to cease after about 600 BC. It has been suggested that this is due to a shift in the perception of Hera, through which her role as a bride of Zeus came to be emphasized over her earlier manifestation as a powerful, independent goddess. In any case, although Hera's role at Samos was never limited to assuring fertility, it must have been closely connected with the Samian successful trading ventures. Stylized wooden ship models were common votives, and in the archaic period, two full-size ships were dedicated in the sanctuary. The cult image of Samian Hera has been described by ancient witnesses as being crudely carved and plank-like. It was wooden, small and light enough to be carried annually to the shore for the Tonea, but it spent the rest of the year ensconced in the temple, dressed in rich garments and wearing a high crown. It also wore a pectoral ornament, resembling an extended collar or series of necklaces, which was characteristic of Eastern Greek and Anatolian deities. The so-called multiple breasts of Artemis at Ephesus are another example. When the Samians built a huge classical temple, they supplied it with a new cultic image that resided in the cella, the normal location. The venerable old image was kept in the pronaeus, or front room of the temple. This arrangement was perhaps dictated by the need to keep the old image in its original location. Its base in the pronaeus stood on the same spot that it had occupied in the cella of the old temple. As we have seen, keeping the image of the goddess fixed in her proper place was a major cultic concern for the Samians. And now, let us take a short break for a word from another one of our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is also brought to you by Simple Contacts. I recently tried an app called Simple Contacts, and it saved me so much time and money on ordering contact lenses, because if you're like me, you probably dread the annual eye appointment to renew your prescription. Well, Simple Contacts brings the doctor to you. Need to renew your prescription? Take a five-minute vision test from your phone or computer. It's reviewed by a licensed doctor. You receive a renewed one-year prescription and reorder your contacts. Already have a prescription that hasn't expired? Just upload a photo or your doctor's information and order your lenses. Simple Contacts offers every brand of lenses that you're familiar with, including options for astigmatism, multifocal lenses, colored contacts, and more, and their prices are unbeatable. Standard shipping is free, and best of all, they're offering a promotion to my listeners. 
To save $30 off of your contact lenses, just go to simplecontacts.com backslash grease18 or enter promo code grease18 at checkout. Again, that's simplecontacts.com backslash grease18 or just enter the promo code grease18 at checkout. This isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam though, but it does offer you convenience, speed, reliability, and savings in updating or renewing your prescription. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. The Horion at Perichora was among the richest minor sanctuaries in all of Greece. Although the literary sources are almost completely silent about this sanctuary, the archaeological finds show that it was of great importance during the Archaic period. It sat in the territory of the prosperous mercantile city-state of Corinth, where it was founded in the 8th century BC and saw the construction of yet another of the very early temples to Hera, as we have noted. The earliest temple had an apsidal, or curved, back wall and was only about 7.5 meters in length. Nothing is known about the cult image, but the goddess here was called Hera Acrea, or of the headland, a reference to the Paracora promontory, on which the sanctuary was situated near a small harbor. 6th century BC dedications to Hera Lemenia, or of the harbor, have also been found. Surprisingly, these appear on a terrace above the harbor itself, and the main part of the sanctuary. An archaic structure on the terrace, which was once thought to be a separate temple of Hera Lemenia, is now considered to have been an auxiliary building, probably a dining room. Blocks used in this building contain dedications to Hera under yet another title, Hera Leucalena, or white-armed. These archaic 7th and 6th centuries BC dedications echo one of Homer's favorite epithets for Hera. The pattern of votives at Paracora showed that this was an important cultic site for local people, as well as for sailors, traveling up and down the Gulf of Corinth. The many imported objects, including Egyptian-style scarabs and Phoenician bronzes, illustrate the wide trading contacts of the archaic Corinthians. The earliest 8th century BC temple at the harbor was accompanied by a deposit of geometric votive objects, including drinking vessels, wine jugs, clay models of cakes presented as offerings to the goddess, called Coluria, and house models. This temple was replaced in the 6th century BC with a new Doric stone temple, and a monumental altar was added. North of the altar, the excavators found a flight of steps, which probably functioned as a spectator area for viewing the sacrifices. The sanctuary of Hera Acrea at Paracora is also connected with the myth of Medea, the young sorceress whom Jason brought back from his travels in the Black Sea region, and who is best known from the play by Euripides, which we discussed in episode 52. This work portrays her as a spurned wife who kills her children by Jason in order to avenge herself for his abandonment, then buries the children in the sanctuary of Hera Acrea and founds their cult there. There were, however, other myths about how the children of Medea died. According to one, Medea took each of her children in turn to the sanctuary of Hera to Keracruptane, or hide them away, thinking that this operation would make them immortal. The word may also mean that she buried them. When her hopes were disappointed and Jason discovered what she had done, he abandoned her. Another version held that Medea instructed her children to bring a poison robe to her rival Glauchy. When Glauchy perished as a result of the gift, the enraged Corinthians stoned the innocent children. The murdered children then took on a supernatural vengeance by causing Corinthian infants to die until the desperate citizens consulted an oracle and were told to institute annual sacrifices to Medea's children. They also set up a statue known as Dama, or Terror, which took the form of a frightening woman. In antiquity, infant mortality was often attributed to female demons, such as Mormo or the Lamia, who had a hideous appearance, and so the statue seems to have been designed to ward off such malign influences. Other sources tell us more about the relationship between the children's cult and that of Hera. Every year, seven boys and seven girls from noble families were dressed in black and sent to live in the sanctuary of Hera Acrea. It is unclear whether this refers to a sanctuary in Corinth itself, since no such sanctuary has been identified, or to the one at Paracora. Regardless, they cut their hair and dedicated it to Medea's children, and presumably participated in the Threnoi, 
or laments sung for the children and the anagasmata or sacrifices for the dead. All these myths and related customs have been taken as evidence of a real, in the distant past, or symbolic child sacrifice to appease hostile divine forces, or as an initiation rite by which the youths and maidens, after a period of separation from the community, reached adult status. Certainly, at least, they indicate that the Corinthians thought that it was necessary to devote elite children to the service of the goddess, and that upon the performance of this service depended the health and welfare of the entire community's children. The rituals originally may have been conducted from Medea herself, since some scholars view her as a divine figure, whose cult was superseded by Hera's. One of the paradoxes of the Panhellenic site of Olympia is that its earliest temple was erected not for Zeus, the primary deity of the sanctuary, but for his wife Hera. During the late 7th century BC, a Heraion was built in the Altus, or sacred enclosure, which then contained no other major structures. Originally, only the foundations were of stone, while the walls were mud brick, and the rest of the structure was wood, including the colonnade. The temple was refurbished in such a way that the columns were gradually replaced in stone, and each one was slightly different in style, thickness, and the type of stone used. The mismatched columns were probably the result of contributions by many donors, each of whom supplied one column and wanted it to be recognizably different from the rest. Nowadays, only three columns remain, after being restored, but they represent the oldest datable temple ruins that we have still somewhat standing. Some scholars, disturbed by the anomaly of a Horaeon as the only temple in a sanctuary of Zeus, have suggested that the temple was from the beginning dedicated jointly to Zeus and Hera, or that it was originally a temple of Zeus and was rededicated to Hera only after Zeus's classical temple was built in the 5th century BC. The question is still open, but we should keep in mind that a temple was never a requirement for a sanctuary, and was often absent from sanctuaries of Zeus, in particular as at Dodona, another Panhellenic sanctuary at Zeus. The focus of Zeus's cult was not actually a cult statue, but the great ash altar where he received his sacrifices. Furthermore, Hera was, as we have seen, one of the earliest temple deities, and the one who was consistently provided with temples in the early Archaic period. Hera's cult in the Altus may have been introduced by Phidon, the 7th century BC king of Argos, who established a military presence in Elis and reorganized the Olympic Games, as we discussed in episode 16. If this is the case, the Temple of Hera originally served as an offshoot of the Argive Horaeon and a reminder of the political and military supremacy of Argos in the early Archaic period. Pausanias provides a detailed description of the temple's amazing contents. The cult image of Hera was seated on a throne, and behind her stood a statue of Zeus wearing a helmet. The positioning of Zeus's statue suggests that he was not the primary deity of this temple, but that his role as Hera's spouse was still important to the cult. This is also borne out by other aspects of the cult, as we will see. Both statues are described as simple works, and thus probably belong to the Archaic period. Nearby were images of many other deities in ivory and gold, some by famous sculptors and others by unknown artists. They include the Horai, or the Seasons, and their mother, Themis, Athena, Demeter, Kor, Apollo, Artemis, Hermes, and so forth. A richly decorated cedarwood chest was dedicated by the family of Kypsilus, the 7th century BC tyrant of Corinth. This famous chest was covered with labeled episodes from heroic myths. We also discussed this in episode 16. There was also a small bed recalling the couch of Hera in the Horaeon at Argos, a disc on which was inscribed the ritual formula for the Olympic truce forbidding men in arms to enter the sanctuary, and the ivory and gold table used to hold the wreaths for Olympic victors. Hera's cult at Olympia was administered by a college of 16 women chosen from the most venerable and respected matrons of Elis, the polis in charge of the site. Hera's supervision of weddings gave her a special link with young women, and it was in this connection that she was honored in a festival called the Horea. This was organized by these 16 matrons and was held concurrently with the Olympic Games every four years as the female counterpart of the famous Olympic Games held in honor of Zeus. Though needless to say, the women's version was far less prestigious and elaborate. Very little information also has been recorded by ancient authors, 
However, while women were generally excluded from the Olympic Games, both as competitors and as spectators, the Haraya involved a foot race for girls of three different age categories. They wore short tunics, which left their right shoulders and breasts exposed, and ran in the same stadium as the men and the boys, though the course for the races was one-sixth shorter. The winners received a portion of the meat from the cows sacrificed to Hera and a crown made from olive tree branches. The 16 women of Ellis also wove a peplos, or robe, for Hera, which was presumably dedicated in the temple and may have adorned the cultic image. They arranged choruses for Physcoa, a Dionysic heroine, and for Hippodynia, the heroine who figures in one of the founding myths at Olympia. It was in order to win the hand of Hippodamia that Pelops raced against her father, the king of Elis, thus inaugurating the chariot races at Olympia. According to tradition, the 16 women trace their origin to Hippodamia, who first formed the college in order to give thanks to Hera for her marriage to Pelops. An alternative story said that the women were brought together as arbiters to settle disputes between the Elians and the Pisatans, who fought over the control of the sanctuary in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. If the story is accurate, this is one of the rare cases in ancient Greek history in which women's religious authority translated into a limited form of political authority. The city of Poseidonia, or Paestum, in southern Italy was settled by Greeks from the Argolid. Within the walls to the south of the city, the new inhabitants built a Doric temple of Hera in the 6th century BC. The temple is notable for its double cella, whose two halves are separated by a central row of columns. Since there was no technical need for this feature, which had been used in early temples in order to support the roof, scholars have speculated that there may have been two cult images. Perhaps Zeus was worshipped here with Hera, as he was at Olympia. In fact, terracottas from the sanctuary show the king and the queen of the gods enthroned together. A second temple to Hera was built beside the first in the 5th century BC and must have contained a newer cultic image. During the 18th century, the temple was erroneously called the Temple of Neptune, the Roman equivalent of Poseidon. Although that distinction lasted for some time, it is no longer the case now. Regardless, it is possible that the temple originally was dedicated to both Hera and Poseidon, as some dedicatory statues found around the large altar are believed to have been for Poseidon. So it's entirely possible that both temples of Hera were shared with other deities, although it isn't conclusive. The cult of Hera at Poseidonia itself was linked to an extra urban sanctuary at the mouth of the river Sella, just north of the city. The medieval lime kilns on the site show that the sanctuary structures were long ago dismantled and the marble components burned, yet it was here that one of the most significant caches of Greek sculpture was uncovered in the 20th century. Buried in the sand and thus they escaped destruction, excavators found more than 30 sculpted metopes from what was probably the earliest temple of Hera at the site dating to the mid-6th century BC. Many of these metopes illustrate the deeds of Heracles, while others are scenes from the epic cycle of poems about Troy. The second larger temple of Hera, dating to about 500 BC, was differently ornamented, with metopes depicting dancing pairs of maidens. The terracotta votives in this sanctuary are very reminiscent of those in the other Horea that we have mentioned, as they show the enthroned goddess holding a spear, a child, a horse, or a pomegranate. Other votive gifts found here to the goddess, that were also found at both Argos and Samos, are implements of war, such as miniature terracotta shields and armor. Like the Horaeon at Samos, this famous sanctuary was supposed to have been founded by Jason and the Argonauts to honor the Argive Hera. Nearby, the sanctuary of Hera Lacinia was located near Croton amidst a densely grown fir forest, which served not only as the religious but also as the political center of the area. It has been described as the most important sanctuary in southern Italy during the Classical period because of its role as the seat of the Achaean and Italian leagues, in which it acted as the guardian of common political institutions and the symbol of a united power against the threat imposed by external enemies. Its rich votives, though, begin earlier in the 7th century BC and include a bronze ship model and a diadem decorated with leaves and acorns that may have adorned a wooden cultic image. Like the other Olympian goddesses, Hera often received gifts of clothing, among which was an elaborate purple cloak, embroidered with figures in gold and silver, and presented by Alcestines of Sybaris. 
The sanctuary also contained numerous chains and tools, which may have been dedications to Hera by prisoners captured during Croton's destruction of Sybaris in 510 BC, after they were ultimately freed. Although Hera was a powerful city goddess who fostered economic and military success, in some of her cults, she was viewed primarily as a goddess of weddings and marriage, and her status as Zeus's consort is central for worshippers. She was often invoked with the cult titles of Zygia, or the Uniter, Gamostolos, or the Preparer of Weddings, Nymphumene, or the Woman Given in Marriage, and Talaya, or the Fulfilled all in reference to her status as an archetypal bride and consort. In Greek culture, marriage and motherhood were the only acceptable goals for most women, and while Hera is not an enthusiastic mother in myth, we have seen that she functions as a nurturing goddess in some cults. Myths of Hera often illustrate the socially sanctioned status of the legitimate wife. The marriage month of Gamelion, which corresponds to late January or early February, appeared in many city calendars and involved special sacrifices to Hera, and was an auspicious time for weddings. Her role as protectress of marriage is obviously linked to her relationship with Zeus, and in visual representations, the two deities are often shown side by side. In the Parthenon frieze, for example, Hera turns to face her husband and raises her veil in the gesture of a bride. In myth and cult, fragmentary references and archaic practices remain of the hero Gamos, or the sacred marriage, of Hera and Zeus. Her union with Zeus was celebrated in the villages of Attica during the minor festival of Hera Gamos, while Zeus Telios and Hera Telia are invoked by Athenian poets in contexts that have to do with marriage. There was also a major cultic site of Hera in the Boeotian city of Plataea. Her temple there contained two statues of the goddess. One was a seated statue sculpted by Callimachus, called Hera Nymphomena, or led as a bride, referring to the marriage procession, and the other was a standing Hera Talia. The goddess's festival, the Didala, was celebrated every four or six years. According to Pausanias' account, this involved the felling of an oak tree that was selected when the Plataeans set out food for the crows in a sacred grove. The first tree that the birds settled in was cut and fashioned into a crude statue called Diadala. At much longer intervals of 60 years, the festival, which was called the Great Diadala, took place. Unlike the annual observance, this involved the participation of cities from all over Boeotia, each of whom contributed a cow and a bull for sacrifice. One of the wooden figures produced at the Quadrennial Festival was dressed as a bride and ceremoniously conducted in a cart from the river Asopus up to the peak of Mount Ketheron. There, along with the other wooden figures and the sacrificial animals, it was burnt in a huge bonfire on the altar. The myth that explained the origin of this custom told how Zeus had quarreled with Hera, who hid herself away in the area of Mount Ketheron. She had finally grown so fed up with his infidelity that she decided to divorce him. So she left him and wouldn't return no matter how much Zeus begged her. And so Zeus returned to Ketheron, an elderly local king renowned for his wisdom and for whom the mountain was named. On his advice on how to find and reconcile with his wife, Zeus dressed up a wooden statue as a bride and then spread the word that he was about to move on from Hera and get remarried. As soon as Hera got wind of it, she and the outraged matrons of Plataea disrupted the wedding procession, rushed at the bride, and tore up her veil, only to discover that the bride was a wooden image. And seeing the wooden statue, she sheathed over in laughter, understanding her husband's trick. Amused, Hera nevertheless insisted on the burning of the false rival, and the two then reconciled. In the historical period, the festival of the Diadala was understood to commemorate the reconciliation of Zeus and Hera, and was therefore a celebration of divine and human marriage. Both of the images in Hera's temple refer to aspects of Hera's concern with legitimate, socially sanctioned unions, and the myth likewise stresses how Hera and the women of Plataea jealously protected their prerogatives as wives in a culture that considered extramarital sex for men normal, yet took seriously the rule that a man must have only one wife. Otherwise, issues of social status and inheritance could become muddied. On the other hand, the festival seems to incorporate elements that predate the myth of Hera's feminine jealousy and point to the worship of an independently powerful goddess. Zeus has no place in the ritual itself, which seems to be akin to other sacred processions attested in Boeotia and elsewhere, such as the Daphnephoria, or the carrying of the laurel, 
Sacrifices on mountain peaks were characteristic of Minoan religion, and a shrine known as the Dedalion is attested for Mycenaean Knossos. Hera's cult, with its marital preoccupations, may have been superimposed upon rituals that were once carried out for a pre-Hellenic tree or mountain goddess, who disappeared and returned on a seasonal basis. At the same time, the myth of Hera's quarrel with Zeus should not be dismissed as a comical tale concocted to explain the ritual. At Stymphalos in Arcadia, there was a similar myth of Hera's quarrel with and separation from Zeus, and there too the goddess's cult titles referred to marital status. Hera, it was said, grew up in Stymphalos, where she was raised by Temenos, who had built a temple for her, instituting her cult. He had decided on paying tribute to the goddess to three different sanctuaries, one as Parthenos, or virgin, and Pada, or girl, for the period before her marriage, one as Talea, or fulfilled, or matron, for the period when she was the wife of Zeus, and one as Kara, or divorcee, or widow, for the period when she had divorced her husband. She received the latter because she returned to Stymphalos while she was quarreling with Zeus, and was without a husband. And so in the Stymphalian cult, Hera provided models for the three stages of female life, as the Greeks conceptualized it. But it was her period of separation from Zeus that provided the impetus for the goddess's return to her own land. Hera's identity as a local goddess could best be manifested when she was apart from Zeus, not installed as his bride on Mount Olympus. On the next episode, since we've already discussed the physical location of the Athenian Agora and the economic activity that took place there in previous episodes, and have now introduced the goddess of marriage and all things of the home herself, let's now shift our attention to something a little less public and a bit more private. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 73, The Oikos and Private Life.